thank you. Um, and thanks, Lucy, for organizing this event. And thanks to Angie Brown for calling us together here to talk about this research work that she's been uh, working on for the last couple months or so. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, it's so funny. I joked earlier this semester, actually, this semester was the first time I saw Angie Brown for the first time because of Zoom technology. <laughs> she and I had actually been working via the phone over the last, um, you know, year, I would say at least, right, on this, uh, on thinking through this project. And it was only this semester that I got to see you face to face. And uh, to give a little background on Angie's journey to this point, uh, she um, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the Citadel and began the program here, the, the graduate program here in 2012, but then took a much larger leave of absence as she moved across the country to Colorado and started a job, as many of our students end up doing, uh, then their thesis time to degree takes a little bit longer, and that's the case with Angie. But um, you'll also see that it, uh, what she's been able to produce is a really sophisticated uh, project. Uh, currently, she is a water resource program analyst for Castle Rock Water, and I'm, I think you'll all be really excited to hear her analysis of these uh, these complicated coordinated partnerships for water management. And uh, with that, I'll let Angie introduce the rest of her committee and the project itself. Well, thank you, Dr. Watson. And thank you everyone for being here today. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to listen to this presentation. Um, for my thesis, I researched the formation and endurance of water management partnerships in the Western US. And my research board consisted, or consists rather, of Dr. Watson and Dr. Matt Nowlin from the College of Charleston, Heather Beasley with the South Metro Water Supply Authority, and Bronson Mack with the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Now, before I go on, I just want to verify, can you all see my screen um, of, with my title slide on it? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So we have quite a bit. Um, oh, goodness. Now I'm not seeing the slides advance. Okay. Um, are you seeing the slides advance? No. Oh, they oh, did now. There it goes. Okay. <laughs> Delayed reaction. We'll get this. We got the bug out of the way, hopefully, early. Um, all right. So we have quite a bit uh, to get through today. So we'll start by taking a look at what we're going to cover during our time together. So first we'll set the stage for my research by looking at the history of water management in the US and theories and models of governance of common pool resources such as water. Next I'll describe my research questions and what case studies and methods were used to find the answers to my questions. And finally, I'll present you with the findings of my research and we'll end with some recommendations. So let's begin by discussing water management in the Western US and what the academic literature has to say about it. The right to utilize water has historically been a point of contention, competition, and mistrust in the Western US. In the midst of this hyper competition over water rights in the West, two water management partnerships formed in this region to make decisions jointly. Much research has been conducted on the formation of partnerships with multiple centers of decision-making or on the sustainability of joint decision-making partnerships, but not necessarily on the formation of joint decision-making partnerships, such as those that we'll look at today. Hardin's 1968 work, The Tragedy of the Commons, postulated that a resource will be depleted by its users unless a centralized authority imposes restrictions on the users. In later years, however, researchers such as Eleanor Ostrom proposed that a resource could be sustainably governed by multiple centers of decision making, a theory known as polycentricity. Eleanor Ostrom studied self-organized partnerships, which had endured at least 100 years and developed a list of characteristics that are likely to be present in enduring partnerships. We'll come back to this later. Eleanor Ostrom furthered her work by showing that self-organization between users of a resource could occur if certain characteristics of the resource and the users were present. Again, I'll come back to this. 
Building on Ostrom's work, Richard Marjoram and Catherine Robinson show that these self-organized partnerships operate in one of two implementation strategies, either collaborative, where we have multiple centers of decision-making, so in the vein of polycentricity, um, or where the users operate in joint decision-making. Furthermore, these partnerships are seen at varying levels of governance of the resource. So for example, um, at the action level, organizations interact directly with the citizens. At the organizational level, um, organizations interact just with one another. And then at the policy level, organizations interact with higher authorities. So coordinated collaborative partnerships at the organizational level are difficult because they span jurisdictional boundaries and the interests of the partnership can compete with the interests of the individual members. The formation of such partnerships is, spar is sparsely researched, but that's what we'll be looking at today. So going back to Eleanor Ostrom, she developed models describing the formation and the endurance of self-organized partnerships, models which I used in my research. Ostrom developed characteristics of both the user and the resource that were likely to result in the user self-organizing to collaborate on the governance of a resource. Here we see the characteristics of the users. Starting with her first characteristic, salience, users are reliant on the resource for their livelihood. Secondly, we have common understanding where the users have a shared image of how the system operates. Third, we have low discount rate where collaboration provides cost savings for the users. Um, oh, I apologize, I got my spots mixed up here. Um, fourth, we have trust and reciprocity um, which is where users demonstrate their trustworthiness to one another. Um, now, it's important to note that Ostrom also said that this could be something that's evolving, so they can make efforts to start to develop that trust and reciprocity. So fifth, we have autonomy, meaning that um, governmental authorities outside of the partnership are not trying to um, impose uh, rules or regulations. Basically, they have autonomy from um, outside authorities. And finally, we have prior organizational experience. And this is where the users either have experience, previous experience in um, local partnerships or they've studied partnerships such as the one that they're trying to pursue. So Austin's second set of characteristics likely to result in self-organization of the users has to do with the resource. So users are likely to self-organize if collaboration will result in the improvement of the resource if indicators of the resource are available at a low cost, if the flow of the resource is relatively predictable, and if the geographic boundaries of the users um, allow, excuse me, if the geographic boundaries allow the users to understand outside influence on the resource as well as micro environments within that geographic boundary. So we, so we just looked at Ostrom's characteristics of users and of the resource that are likely to result in self-organization. Now we'll look at principles she describes as likely to be present in long-lasting partnerships. According to Ostrom, long-lasting partnerships um, are likely to have the following characteristics or design principles present. So first, uh, there will be clear boundaries between the users and the resource. There will be good fitting rules that are reflective of local conditions. There will be collective choice arrangements where affected users have a say in the operational rules. Um, those that monitor use of the resource are either the users or are accountable to the users. There are graduated sanctions. So penalties that are assessed by the severity of the infraction um, so not following the rules, you have graduated sanctions. Then we have conflict resolution, where arenas are available for users to resolve conflicts. And we have right to organize, where users, um, the, the user's right to organize is not challenged by outside authorities. And finally, Ostrom allowed for an eighth principle for more complex system, excuse me, more complex systems, specifically those with multiple layers of gover governance. Think federal, state, city, Etc. So with that background, let's now discuss my research, what questions I tried to answer, how the research was conducted, and what my study areas were. So understanding that users can organize to self-govern and that this is difficult to do at the organizational level, 
I wanted to understand how two self-organized partnerships formed in the Western U.S. to manage the regional water resources. So my first question was, I have worked in, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, my first question was, what catalyzed the formation of two coordinated water management partnerships at the organizational level, not sanctioned by governmental authorities? Nevada and Colorado authorities. So basically, um, partnerships that formed on their own without outside organizations saying you have to do this. Um, I've worked in some capacity with one of these case studies for the last five years. And going into this, I thought or hypothesized that I would find that the water providers would come together because the resource was so depleted, they ultimately had no other course of action for sustainable supply. Now, to answer this question, I use Ostrom's models of characteristics of the resource and characteristics of the users likely present in self-organization, which we discussed earlier. My second question was, do these partnerships have the characteristics of those that are sustained across generations in organizational turnover? To answer this, I use Ostrom's model of long-lasting partnerships, her eight design principles. The two partnerships I studied were the South Metro Water Supply Authority in Colorado, just south of Denver, and the Southern Nevada Water Authority in Las Vegas. In my thesis, I refer to the to South Metro as Colorado Authority and Southern Nevada as the Nevada Authority. Here you can see the makeup of the partnership. Some items to, to note are that the Nevada Authority was established in the early 90s and the Colorado Authority was established in the early 2000s. Nevada is comprised of seven providers and serves roughly 2 million customers, while Colorado is comprised of 13 members and serves roughly 300,000 customers. Finally, it's important to point out that Nevada has one very large user who alone serves roughly 1 million customers, while the Colorado Authority has four large users serving between 55,000 and 100,000 customers each. We'll come back to this later. To answer question one, I utilized transcribed oral histories from Nevada and conducted semi-structured interviews with Colorado, which I later transcribed. With these transcriptions, I applied codes to track the presence of Ostrom's characteristics. You can think of coding kind of like tagging or hashtagging, basically keeping track of where these showed up and how often they showed up. I also looked for common and recurrent themes, which I refer to here as emergent themes. This was done in two rounds of coding. At the end, I looked for the most frequent and the most commonly observed codes, which we will discuss shortly. To answer question two, I coded the partnership's documentation to look for the presence of Austin's design principles of long-lasting partnerships. These documents included meeting minutes, master plans, governing documents, and a few other miscellaneous documents. Coding was done in one round, and at the end of it, I looked to see if, one, the principles were all present, and if so, two, which ones occurred the most and least frequently. It's important to note that I looked at the percentage of each partnership's total codes rather than at the raw number to identify frequent and common codes. Which brings us to our results. We'll begin by looking at the results for question one, but first, in order to understand what we're looking at and to provide some context to our discussion, let's take a, uh, take a brief look at a summary of how each partnership formed. In the early 1900s, as settlers moved into Nevada, users were reliant on non-renewable groundwater. Later in the early 1920s, Nevada was allocated shares of Colorado River water through an interstate compact. Then Las Vegas experienced many years and many waves of unprecedented growth. At times, this was considered the fastest growing area in the nation. Water, water providers competed over water rights in part to attract development to their jurisdictions. However, the water supplies weren't enough to sustain the area at their current rate of use, and there was the threat of running out of water. Interestingly, the manager at the time of the, at the, time of the largest user had read an article on his flight back from Washington, D.C. that described a similar situation on the Potomac River that was resolved through partnership initiated by a feasibility study process. So the largest user hired the consultant, WRMI, and conducted their own study and invited the other users in the resource to join in to find a solution. The feasibility study found that their river water allocations should be sent to where development was happening so they would need to pull the resources together to meet demand. Moving over to the Colorado Authority, 
South of Denver, developers began constructing developments with non-renewable groundwater as their main supply. The understanding at the time was that the aquifer system had plenty of water and the resource's largest user would one day take over the area as they had been doing up until that point. However, the largest user in the common pool resource decided to stop expanding and drew their boundary limits, but they invited these small water providers to join them in a large renewable water project that would provide renewable water to meet the entire projected demand of the southern Denver area, excuse me, south metro Denver area, which was roughly 100,000 acre feet annually. After spending $40 million on permitting, the EPA vetoed the project in, I think, 1990, and the small water providers were back at square one. They continued to meet together to find a way to partner with the largest user on a new project. After a feasibility study showed that reliance on groundwater would not be sustainable, they formed the Colorado Authority to develop regional projects that they couldn't do on their own. As a reminder, my hypothesis for question one is written above. Essentially, I thought that the partnership's formation would be dependent on the state of the resource and that the formation would essentially be driven by a need to meet demands but also to better the resource conditions. What I found uh, drove the formation was appropriator attribute number one, salience of the resource, attribute two, common understanding, resource attribute one, feasible improvement, and the emergent theme, influencers. So how did I arrive at this conclusion? Um, not only were these codes frequently observed, but they also co-occurred with one another more than any other code. The code that next most frequently co-occurred but was not especially prevalent was appropriator attribute number three, low discount rate of collaboration. Basically, low discount rate wasn't coded especially often, but when it was coded, that same excerpt was also coded with one of the characteristics you see here. So in my mind, that means cost didn't necessarily drive the partnership, but it was a supporting character, uh, excuse me, a supporting consideration, something we'll see a little later. So let's take a look at each of these. We'll, we'll go in general order of how the users or the water providers came together. The first characteristic we'll look at was frequently observed that, I'm sorry, let me start again. The first characteristic we'll look at that was frequently observed was salience of the resource. In other words, users were relying on the resource for their livelihood, so it was an absolute necessity that they solve any projected gaps in water supply and demand. I coded transcriptions whenever an interviewee discussed the community's reliance on the water provider, so in this case the user, um, for clean water. Then, uh, I'm sorry, then when they mentioned their reliance on the water source, so either groundwater or surface water, or when they mentioned the community potentially running out of water. This was a driver to the partnership's formation because local economies were threatened by the prospect of running out of water. In Colorado, for example, at one time, uh, prior to the authorities, Colorado authorities' formation, the governor questioned whether signs should be put out in front of homes that were for sale, stating that water service wasn't guaranteed. And at least one company that I heard of told employees who were relocating there that they shouldn't move to certain areas because they may run out of water at some point. So the impacts of running out of water were a real threat. The next characteristic we'll look at is common understanding. The users each had a general idea that their use of the resource affected one another and that their prob the problems they were facing were larger than their individual jurisdictions. So both partnerships gathered their users to study the resource and to understand how they affected one another and what could be done to mitigate the risk of eventually running out of water. I coded transcriptions when, whenever an interviewee discussed how their use impacted others, how use of the resource by others impacted them, and whenever they discussed the feasibility study and the study findings. So both partnerships did conduct feasibility studies. This was a driver to the partnership.
Hey, Angie. Can you hear me? I don't mean to interrupt, but I don't think I can see your screen right now. Yeah, I think yeah. it got kicked off of share screen and I didn't. Yeah, I, and I can't hear you either. Yeah, I think you need to we call lost you, I think, for, yeah, just an, the uh, last can you hear I me now? Out, I was trying to figure out if it was just me. <laughs> yes, I can hear you now. Too. Lost your yeah, screen. please. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, right, yeah, I think just, maybe lost I would, the last minute. Perfect. Yeah, just start this slide um, again, I think. Yeah, sure. No problem. I apologize for that. A, no, it's not you. Um, well, I mean, it's it's the technology. So <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know if I well, was the you. only one. <laughs> oh, no problem. And feel free to stop me again if that happens again. So, um, all right. So I'll restart this slide over. Um, but just to confirm, you did see the last the last slide uh, concerning um, uh, common understanding. Is that correct? Yeah, we saw. I saw common understanding. Okay. Okay, great. So we'll just start here again. So the next characteristic we'll look at is feasible improvement. So this means that collaboration of users will likely improve resource conditions. I coded transcriptions whenever an interviewee discussed the improvement or potential improvement of a water resource, and this includes con uh, conservation. Collaborating um, with other users for additional resources or for construction of infrastructure to access underutilized resources. This was a driver to the partnerships formations because the costs that were required to access additional supplies were such that no one entity could complete these projects on their own. Now you may be asking how projects to access additional supplies can be considered improvement of the resource. Well, Austin specifically defines this characteristic with regard to the flow of resource units. And remember, her models are describing how users self-organize to avoid the tragedy of the commons or the total depletion of the resource. So in this case, I'm sorry, in these case studies, organizations, um, organization meant finding alternate supplies they would need to bring in to avoid depleting the sources they were currently reliant on. Essentially, they were diversifying the resource portfolio. So in that sense, they feasibly improved both the resource and their access to the resource. It's important to note that while both partnerships were focused on access to additional supplies, their efforts to imp improve the flow of resource units also included conservation programs. The last most frequently observed code we'll look at is influencers, which was an emergent theme. In other words, something I saw frequently outside the models we discussed earlier. Influencer is an umbrella term I use to describe any person or organization that directly impacted the partnership's formation. I had several of these umbrella terms for emergent themes, but this is the one that uh, was most frequently observed between the partnerships. There were many subcodes under the umbrella theme, and the two most frequently observed were the largest user and individuals. I coded transcriptions whenever an interviewee discussed specific people or organizations that impacted the formation of the partnership. This was a driver to the partnership's formations because the largest water providers had the most resources and regional influence that was needed to make positive changes to regional problems. And individuals, as Marjoram and Robinson postulated, were needed to build trust among the users, also known as Ostrom's appropriator attribute number four trust and reciprocity. So I want to spend a little time here discussing specifically the largest user because soon we'll see some difference in the partnerships which I think can be partially explained by how the largest, um, by how the largest user impacted the formation process. So let's first take a look at the sizes of the users in our case study so that we have a so that we can better understand the impact of size on the partnerships formations. These numbers represent users that were um, mentioned in interviews with regard to the formation process. So these don't necessarily represent all users in these common pool resources. So our first size category was large user or largest user for those serving 1 million or more customers. Nevada and Colorado both have one large user, but Colorado's largest user is not part of the authority, while Nevada's largest user is. The medium large users serve between 240,000 and 500,000 customers. Nevada has three large users and Colorado has one. Though again, Colorado's medium large is not part of the authority, while Nevada's three medium large are. The medium small users serve between 50,000 and 100,000 users. Nevada has, doesn't have any medium small users. 
um, but Colorado has four, and all part of them, all four of them are part of the authority. Finally, the small users serve under 35,000 customers. Nevada has two small users, and Colorado has nine. Um, all of these are part of their respective authorities. So this will set the stage for our next couple of slides. So it turns out that when I went back to look at Austrian's work, that was not part of her models. In her 2000 work, Austrian theorizes that the interests of the largest user in the resource can impact whether or not self-organization occurs, though she does preface this by stating that more research is needed. Ostrom postulates that if the largest user is highly reliant on the resource and would have a low discount rate to collaborate with smaller users, that a partnership is likely. However, the largest user is not highly reliant, um, pardon me, if the largest user is not highly reliant on the resource and the partnership would result in increased costs, self-organization might be impeded. So let's look at our case studies. In Nevada, the, heart, the largest user was highly reliant on the resource and had a low discount rate of cooperation. They did have to pay more than their fair share at times, but ultimately uh, long-term costs were reduced through partnership. In Colorado, on the other hand, the largest user had a diversified por portfolio, so they were not highly reliant on any one resource. And collaboration meant a higher cost of operating their water supplies and, and frankly, a higher risk with partnering um, with smaller water providers. So they couldn't justify taking on the risk of smaller providers that only had, um, that primarily had one source of supply, water supply. But as we know, Formation Colorado did happen. So, so we already know that Colorado's largest user was out, but we still have four medium small providers. So for our purposes, those are now the largest providers in, um, in our resource. Three of the four largest providers had some resources of had some sources of renewable supplies or they were in process of securing renew, renewable supplies. So they weren't as highly reliant on the resources as the other providers. Although these three did have similar interests to the small users in that they wanted to reduce their reliance on non-renewable groundwater, they, similar to the largest user in Colorado, were the parties with the most assets who would likely disproportionately carry the cost of partnership. However, the largest user had indicated they would work on a renewable water project with one group, which in part motivated the medium small providers to join the partnership. So the Colorado Authority was ultimately formed. This sets the stage for where we see some differences in the two authorities. So as we just saw, in Nevada, the largest user had similar interests as the smaller users. This resulted in the Nevada Authority having one very large user that the others were afraid would steamroll them. In order to make partnership happen, um, which the largest user needed as much as the others, um, the largest user had to actively show the others they could be trusted. The largest user spent a lot of time and a lot of money to build trust and, uh, trust and reciprocity, appropriator attribute or user characteristic number four, which is why this characteristic was so prevalent in the Nevada transcription and likely why the smaller water providers were willing to enter into an all-in partnership, meaning all users were required to participate in all of the authorities' projects, regardless of whether or not individual users personally benefited from each of these projects. Now, Colorado's largest user did not have the same interests as the smaller users, and even three of the four medium small users that are now part of the Colorado Authority didn't necessarily have the same austrian defined interests as the small users. However, the prospect of partnering with the largest user provided enough benefits for the small provider, medium small providers that they were willing to join the Colorado Authority. However, the Colorado users did not have a large user like Nevada that could uh, bear the burden of cost and was actively working to build trust and reciprocity. So I believe this in part resulted in the opt-in format, which allows the medium small users to maintain autonomy and lessen any uneven cost share impacts that they might bear for being the largest users in the authority. This format did provide the Colorado Authority with an avenue to pursue regional projects with one another and with the largest user. Um, that motivation prior to formation uh, kept users coming together to meet over 10 years until the feasibility study was conducted and the Colorado Authority was subsequently formed. It's also why appropriator attribute number six, 
prior organizational experience was so prevalent in the Colorado Authority. In short, my analysis shows that the largest user directed the path of each authority's formation according to Ostrom's 2000 theory. Now that we have an understanding of how these partnerships formed, um, which was question one, let's move on to question two regarding the endurance of the partnerships. So as a reminder, question two was, do these partnerships have the characteristics of those that are sustained across generations and across organizational turnover? And above you can see these design principles that we discussed earlier, which are the principles I look for in the partnerships documents. To answer this question, I coded documents from each partnership and looked for the presence and prevalence of Austrian's design principles, as well as whether those were sustained through changes in leadership, participants, or otherwise. I found that yes, all of Ostrom's design principles were present, and yes, they were all sustained across organizational changes. This graph shows the prevalence of the design principles in each partnership's documents and is shown as a percent of all codes for this, this specific partnership, not as a raw number. The principles depicted in green were the most prevalent for both partnerships. These were nested enterprises and collective choice arrangements. The principle in orange, graduated sanctions, was the least prevalent for both partnerships. The first design principle that was frequently observed was nested enterprises, meaning that the resources being governed in an essentially um, multi-layered governing structure. Again, think of uh, cities within counties, within states, within the US federal government. That's a concept similar to and sometimes the same as what we're discussing here. I coded documents whenever excerpts discussed participation in um, in a larger organization, governance by a larger organization, individual water providers, or committees, projects, or otherwise that the partnerships or its members participated in. Ostrom says it best as to why this is an indicator of the partnership's endurance. Establishing rules at one level without rules at other levels will produce an incomplete system that may not endure over the long run. In my thesis, I reintroduced the Ostrom levels uh, excuse me, Ostrom designed, defined levels of governance discussed in the literature review. To be more specific, governance at the policy level, which is large government to organization, um, at the organizational level, which is organization to organization, and then at the action level, which is organization to citizen. Reading through the authority's documents, it's hard to describe the ability for each partnership to effectively govern the resource without discussing how the authorities are influenced by or are influencing users at higher and lower levels of governance. This is important to note because it'll provide some context for the last two principles we'll look at. The second design principle that was frequently observed was collective choice arrangements, meaning that users have the ability to participate in the rulemaking process regarding use of the resource. In our case studies, this is largely in reference to projects and other endeavors undertaken by the partnerships which its members participate in by extension and which can affect their citizens' utilization of the resource. In other words, decisions are made by the partnerships which operate at that organizational level um, and can have downstream impact, if you will, on their citizens, the end users. I coded documents um, with this attribute whenever excerpts discuss the ability of users to provide guidance on partnership uh, direction, to provide input on new or existing rules, or to provide input um, regarding projects impacting the use of the resource. Ostrom demonstrates that this is an indicator of the partnership's endurance because users who directly interact with one another and with the physical world can modify the rules over time so as to better fit them with the specific characteristics of their setting. Now that we've covered the most frequently observed design principles, let's take a look at the least prevalent design principle, noted in orange, which is graduated sanctions. Um, you can see that, it's kind of hard to see, but here it is for the Colorado Authority and here it is for the Nevada Authority. So the least prevalent design principle, graduated sanctions, um, refers to the penalties applied for not following rules and is applied in relation to the infraction. I coded documents whenever excerpts discuss fees or other penalties for not following rules. This design principle is not frequently observed in documentation due to those levels of governance that we discussed earlier. The assessment of penalties for not following rules are conducted by the water providers in relation to their citizens, not by the partnerships um, in relation to the citizens. Therefore, 
The planning is done at the organizational level, while the monitoring and assessment of penalties or those graduated sanctions is done at the action level. That said, monitoring and graduated sanctions can also be imposed on the partnerships from the policy level by higher governing authorities. So this is why the graph shows a higher occurrence of monitoring and graduated sanctions for the Nevada authority, because they work directly with higher authorities to whom they're accountable as a group for their use of Colorado River water. So in summary, I answered question one by showing uh, that common drivers to form the formation of the Colorado and Nevada authorities were their reliance on the resource, a common understanding of how the resource system operates, and feasible improvement of the resource as a result of collaboration. Furthermore, I presented influencers as, as an emergent theme, which includes the influence on the formations by both individuals and the largest user. We discuss Ostrom's theory, which proposed that the interests of the largest user would either encourage or impede self-organization. I demonstrated that Ostrom's theory held true for both authorities, though I proposed that despite the difference in interest by the largest users, both ultimately guided the direction of the partnership in one way or, or another. And finally, I answered question two, stating that Ostrom's design principles were present in both partnerships' documentation and endured across organizational changes. We further discussed which principles were most and least prevalent in the documentation. And I argue that this is in part due to the level at which the partnerships govern the resources since they are embedded in nested enterprises. With these, with these findings, I will briefly make a few recommendations to the partnership and to researchers for further study, and then I'll open it up for questions. As we've discussed, nested enterprises are critical to the sustainable governance of water and as a common pool resource. So with this in mind, it would be wise to, for the partnerships to continue to pursue opportunities for collaboration at your various levels of governance. So for example, water providers within these partnerships could share their data on the health of their resource systems and utilize the shared data to identify opportunities for further collaborative governance. Additionally, be on the lookout for the presence or absence of Ostrom's design principles at the various levels of governance. There could be opportunities to impl implement missing principles or to learn from how the principles are effectively implemented at other levels of governance. This will help ensure the longevity of your partnership. In relation to customers, maybe there's um, opportunities to carry the concept of collaboration down through to the end user, the customers. If we think about it, nested enterprises govern our water resources from the federal level down through the water providers. At each level, our partnerships are collaborating to more effectively govern our common pool resources. But then we serve water as an on-demand product to our customers, not something we have to work with others to sustainably steward as we do at these other levels of governance. While it may not be feasible or realistic to carry this idea down to households, maybe it could work in a pilot program with HOAs and their landscapers. As an example, HOAs could collectively purchase a volume of water to steward through the summer as users of a common pool resource. HOAs could be provided with Ostrom's design principles to develop their own rules of use um, to, govern, to govern the resource, and the water providers would only assess penalties or um, would only assess penalties for excessive use or grant awards for going uh, below their planned water use. So if this research has interested you and you'd like to investigate another angle, I've listed here some potential areas of study, and I'll just highlight a couple of them. Colorado River is what initially started me down this path of researching collaborative partnerships. So users on the river are working together to avoid the first ever call on the, on the river, which would set precedence at the federal level and which users desperately want to avoid. I imagine the study would be very similar to the research presented here, but would be on a much larger scale with many layers of, govern of governance. I found Ostrom's theory on the influence of the largest user to be very interesting, but also predictive in these two case studies. Research on other water partnerships could focus on this relationship in a comparative case study to see if this trend continues. Concerning methodology, um, while the emergent, emergent themes definitely added color to the narrative, I'd recommend focusing on Ostrom's attributes 
and principles, but would also include Ostrom's theory on size and heterogeneity, which includes the uh, largest user. Um, on this slide, I call that Ostrom other. I'd also recommend focusing on the formation of the partnership and analyzing documentation using feasibility studies or workshops as part of your data set. I found uh, the comparative case study to be very useful and would recommend this as a methodology. So with that, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and to listen to me. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. <laughs> time, time for the applause, Zoom applause. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's a there's my little hand zoom applause. Um, you can unscreen share now. Um, oh, great. And uh, and now what our procedure is uh, to go over a little bit. Um, we are now going to have an open Q and A, and anyone, uh, committee member or non committee member, can uh, request either in the chat box or uh, raise in your hand, and and we'll call on you for for part of the Q and A. And once we're done with the public Q and A, it'll just be uh, the committee members and Angie talking. Um, so, does anyone have any questions to start off with? I, I will uh, be the first to wish you a congratulations on a on a well done presentation of this work. Uh, that is certain. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. I will, uh, I will go from SNWA. Just a question, Angie, because I know that you had to work primarily from transcripts based on the information that was available from SNWA. Part of that being that either the individuals that were responsible for the formation of the Southern Nevada Water Authority were um, either unavailable or literally like have passed, have passed on um, or, or, or at a are at a stage in their life where they're really not able to talk through all of the details. So you had to work a lot from oral history. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about like the distinctions that you might have come across having to pull from oral history as opposed to having actual interviews? Like were there some challenges there uh, that, that, you, that you faced and can you talk through those just a little bit? Sure, and, and thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. So, um, I think you highlighted something that was definitely a challenge, and that was that um, that I was able to conduct those interviews with the South Metro Water Supply Authority in person. Um, so I was able to uh, hear voice fluctuations, see facial expressions, hand gestures, and um, could infer their meaning more clearly with with that, I guess, extra set of data. Um, which I just didn't have in those, those transcriptions from the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, and additionally, because I work for the South Metro Water Supply Authority, um, I've worked for them now for almost five years in some capacity, there's, there's some phraseology or some projects that I just know what they are. And there's some things in the Southern Nevada Authority that I can make best guesses about, um, especially with, uh, with acronyms and um, you know, some specific jargon. So that was definitely a challenge. But I think ultimately, when it comes to seeing Ostrom's principles, that there were some very clear um, words or phrases or descriptions of relationships that, that really showed that those were uh, prevalent and those models were applicable. So did I answer your question? Yeah, you sure did. And I'll just follow that up also with a comment. In your thesis, you had also indicated that you had started doing some video as part of your interviews, but you cut that out because you noticed that that video really influenced the behavior of uh, the folks that you were talking to. And, and I just, I found that to be a really smart move on your part, being somebody who does video and does on-camera work and works with other people on camera, you are so correct that their behavior really will change uh, and be influenced by on-camera work. So I thought that that was a very smart thing of you to do uh, to make that adjustment for for the, the betterment of your interviews and, and substances. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, you know, I was a little concerned I wouldn't get the data I needed from that transcription, but I actually did get, still get a significant amount. So, um, so it was still good. 
Lucy, why don't you ask your question? I have a, just a just a general question. So again, you're getting a master's degree and you only have a limited amount of time and resources available to you within a master's degree. Let's say you had maybe two more years to accumulate data. Um, and let's say COVID maybe wasn't a thing because I know that definitely impacted your availability to people and to reach out to different networks. Um, what would you expand on within those, those two years to build this study? That is a really great question. Um, I think that, so, I mean, this may be overdoing it a little, but I think I might have even done a, a third round of coding and simplified those emergent themes a little more. Um, I probably would have dug into the feasibility studies and some of the documentation that came from that because, you know, I, um, some of the South Metro members did send me some data um, and, and that added a lot of understanding to these transcripts. So especially for somebody who's not engulfed in the partnership like I am with the Colorado Authority, that would be a really valuable piece of data to really sort through and code in a third round. Um, and I would even say that I would, I showed it on my recommendation slide, but didn't really touch on it. I would start to dig into these nested layers of enterprises. Um, so with the, the South Metro Water Supply Authority, for example, there is a second layer for a regional project called the WISE Authority. There's only a certain amount of members that participate in that. And having worked on that project for the last five years, I very clearly can see Ostrom's design principles there. So then the question because, becomes, um, do her models for formation actually apply to that? And then both partnerships had conservation programs. Um, that are mentioned in their master plans, but I didn't necessarily look into those documents. So I think looking at those nested enterprises and how um, they interact with one another, how they form, if Ostrom's principles are, are there too, I think that would have been really valuable. Thank you. Lucy's ready to build it into a PhD project, sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> that next step. Go right. for it. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Well, I'll just say I, this is close to a PhD project already, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Thank you. But I, I, I just have a uh, quick sort of practical um, question that might be of use to students that are looking at doing coding in the future. But could you just sort of talk a little bit about how you actually coded the documents? Um, how, you know, how you, what software you used, um, if any? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and interestingly, um, I, I had a consultant call me recently to ask questions about, um, to basically do the same thing, do interviews to determine what would be needed in a drought monitoring plan or in a, in a drought model, a predictive drought model. And so I said, hey, look at this software. This was great in coding. Um, so I, I use what's called deduce. So D E E D excuse me, D-E-D-O-O-S-E. -O -O -E. um, and that was a lifesaver. Dr. Watson recommended it to me. And um, it's so easy I to, to code. Matt, you can color code. <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Matt. I got the recommendation from Matt. <laughs> Very smart. I loved it. Um, so you can color code. You can write descriptions of what each of your codes mean. There's all sorts of really cool analysis graphs and word clouds, and you can export it to Excel. And that's where... That was my jam. I exported it to Excel and then played with it a lot in there. So I would highly recommend that. Um, and, and kind of on that note too, I also used uh, a software called Transcribe to transcribe my semi-structured interviews, which was helpful in, in getting the interviews done, but I still had to listen and correct words within it. So it saves some time, but not anything that may be significant, unless you're a slow typer like me. So. Great, great, thanks. I'm a glad to do work out. Yeah, thank you. Me too. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I'll I'll follow up with a little bit of a the, I'll follow up with a question that's a little on the tough side, um, just because of the nature of the question. And so imagine you're trapped in an elevator with somebody that didn't know these contexts and didn't know this project. 
what's your two or three sentence summary of your research in terms of what did you learn uh, about the comparison between the two different water authorities, right? What what's the what's what is the really big thing that that um, really struck you about the comparison aspect? Regarding the formation, I would say that the the user with the most assets, the most resources, the most finances, the most political influence, um, if they have have if they are reliant on that resource and if partnership will re result in cost savings for them in the long term, you can likely create a partnership with them. And, um, and additionally, once the partnership's created, you're going to want to make sure that um, there's a specific set of rules that are adhered to about how the users uh, utilize the resource and hold each other accountable for that use. And that's the comparison. Yes. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Did I answer your question completely? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, I mean, what did we learn about Colorado and Nevada? Like, what did we learn about them? So I would say together that we learned that um, these partnerships were, were driven by their reliance on this resource and the their ability to improve their access to the resource and basically spread out their reliance across um, you know different sources like groundwater and surface water um, and and what really brought them together was a common understanding of how that system operated so a feasibility study would be was utilized by both partnerships and really helped bring them to that common understanding Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Angie? Okay, I see nothing in chat or nothing uh, going on. I have a feeling that, you know, we've we had some of those students that have papers due today that are going to be watching this <laughs> recording and they should be uh, they may end up uh, sending some questions that I hope uh, you will be amenable to answer if they do come your way. Because um, I know this Absolutely. is a, pretty, you know, Ostrom is pretty popular right now amongst our, our student cohorts. So I know there's going to be quite a few viewers to see how you applied her theories to, to look at these case studies. Um, so with that, thank you to the public that, that came in. And um, it's now just going to be the committee and uh, Angie. Uh, speaking. So say your goodbyes and congrats.